Welcome back everyone. To this lecture, we're going to be coding out a hyperparameter search for dbscan and exploring the differences between adjusting epsilon as well as minimum number of samples or points. Let's head to the notebook and get started. Okay, here I am in the Jupyter Notebook. I've gone ahead and imported NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib.PyPlot, and Seaborn. What I'm going to do now is upload two datasets, and they're going to be the two blobs dataset. So we'll say PD read CSV, and then in the data folder, I'm going to read in the cluster two blobs. So note, it's not cluster blobs, it's cluster two blobs. And then I'm going to upload one more data set, which is two blobs outliers. And it's essentially the same set of data points we saw on the slides with the three outliers. So I'm going to say data cluster, and this one is called two blobs outliers. So if we do a simple scatter plot, SNS scatter plot, and then if we take a look at the data itself, so data two blobs, just as before, it's x1 and x2 for the actual column names. So x is x1, you can say y is x2, run that, and this is what two blobs looks like. So again, it's just a data frame with x1 and x2, some feature values. And let's do the exact same thing for two blobs, but with outliers. So very similar data set, just use tab to autocomplete there. And it's the same data set we saw in the slides, but notice there's three points that are clear outliers from these two clusters. And same deal, it's simply a data frame with x1 and x2. Okay, so now that we understand that, let's go ahead and continue by beginning to understand label discovery and how it's affected by the actual search of hyperparameters. And just as before, to simplify things, I'm gonna create a display categories function which is gonna be kind of a helper function that takes in a model. And before we put the model in the function, we'll decide what the hyperparameters are. And it's going to take in some data. So we're gonna say labels is equal to model fit underscore predict data. And then we'll simply do a scatter plot just as we did before, where the data is equal to the data. And since they share the same names, we can just say x1, x2, However, the hue will be colored by the labels we just discovered with dbscan. And to make things a little clearer, I'm gonna choose a different color mapping or different palette. And the one I'm gonna choose is called set one. Okay, so we have this helper function and now let's go ahead and bring in from sklearn dot cluster import and then in all caps dbscan. And I'm going to create an instance of dbscan that just uses the default values. And recall, if you ever want to figure out what the default values are, you can always just call help on dbscan, and it will inform you the default values here, or you can check the online documentation. Now let's continue by checking out the performance of the default values. So we're going to go ahead and run our display categories, and recall that up here we've already created an instance of dbscan with the default values of epsilon of 0.5 and minimum samples of 5. So we'll come back down here to actually saying display categories, and then we'll pass in that dbscan model, and we'll pass in two blobs. Recall this is two blobs, not two blobs of outliers. So just with the default values, you'll notice it senses that these three particular points are going to be classified as negative one, which is dbscan's way of saying that these are outlier points. They don't actually belong to any particular cluster. So they're neither border nor core points. Now what we can also do is check this out on the two blobs outliers. And you notice here, it does identify these three middle points as outliers, but continues to identify these three other points close to cluster one in green as also being outliers. So let's explore how epsilon is actually going to affect the results here. So we can just copy this actually and paste it in here, but instead of passing in dbscan with the default values, I'm going to pass in dbscan. And let's just imagine if we had a tiny epsilon value. So recall the default is 0.5. I'm going to say my value is 0.001, so much smaller. Recall epsilon is the maximum distance between two samples for one to be considered as in the same neighborhood of the other. And so what we should think about here is as epsilon gets smaller, then there's a really tiny maximum distance which means pretty much everything should be an outlier. So when you run this, 
no point is discovering any other point within epsilon distance, so that means it's essentially saying everything here is an outlier. Alternatively, if you did an epsilon that was too large, such as epsilon 10, and ran the same thing, while the colors may look the same, you notice that it's not labeling everything as negative one, it's labeling everything as zero. Essentially, the circle or range of epsilon is so large that all the other points are fitting within the same cluster. So everything here, you can imagine this is just some huge epsilon and everything is being crossed over and fitting from the same range, so everything is in the same cluster. Either way, we probably don't want these two results. Instead, we want something kind of in the sweet zone. So if we set epsilon is equal to one, we can see we have our desired outcome. We have these two clusters and then three points as outliers of negative one. And we can check on this by saying dbscan dot labels underscore, and it returns the actual labels, it's indexed for the points, which means I could actually do some sort of Boolean comparison, like tell me where dbscan labels is equal to one, which gives me true or false, and then I could take the sum of this with npsum, and I could actually measure how many outliers were found. So with this particular DB scan and after being trained by being passed into display categories, I can tell it found three outliers, these three outliers in the middle. This is very useful if you have an idea of what percent of outliers or what percent of points should be outliers or the actual number of outliers you expect. And this is the same sort of logic we're going to be using in our calculation to chart reasonable epsilon values. And keep in mind, you can do something like npsum dbscan labels, check if it's equal to negative one. This returns back the actual number of outlier points. So this is total outliers found or labeled. If we wanted this in terms of percentage, what we could say is 100 times this value divided by the length of dbscan labels. So when you run this, it's gonna tell you uh, the that basically 0.3% of points were labeled as outliers, which makes sense because we essentially have 1,000 points in this data set, 1,003 points, so very close to 1,000 points. So here we can see the total percent of points classified as outliers. Okay, so what we can do here is a little loop in order to create some sort of elbow plot to see at what point of the epsilon value are we getting some sort of dramatic change. And you can do this either by thinking of terms of total outliers found or total number of points classified as outliers. And obviously these two are gonna be correlated with each other since one is just a total and then one is this total in terms of percentages. So what we're gonna do here is create two lists. So we're gonna say outlier percent and the other one's going to be number of outliers. And then we're going to say here is four epsilon in NP. And I would advise to use linear spacing here, starting from some really small value, such as 0 0.001 to some really large value like 10. And this is for demonstration purposes. You'll probably want to hone this down to something smaller than 10, maybe something slightly larger than 0 0.001. But you'll get an idea of that once you see the actual plot. We're going to create our model. dbscan is equal to dbscan except now we're going to set epsilon equal to the epsilon in this current linear spacing. Then we'll say db scan, and I'm going to say fit to two blobs outliers. Notice I'm not saying fit predict, instead I will say fit here, and I can then still grab dbscan.labels. So the way I can do that is by just copying what we had up here. So the total number of outliers found is going to be equal to this same calculation. So this is the total number of outliers found, which means I'm gonna say number of outliers append this particular value. And then what I'm going to do is calculate the same thing, but in terms of the outlier percentage, which we know we already have up here, percent of points classified as outliers. I simply copy that. I'm gonna set it equal to a variable such as percent outliers is equal to that particular value, whoops. Let's go ahead and remove that comment, place it up here, and then move this to be on the same line. There we go. So we have percent outliers is equal to that calculation we did earlier, but I wanna keep track of them as epsilon changes. So I'll say outlier percent, go ahead and copy that. And then we're gonna append the percent outlier for that particular loop. Okay, 
And something else you could also keep track of is sometimes people like to keep track of the number of clusters in total. So we already know DB scan labels has those clusters. So if we were to run this again, so I just ran that and notice there's negative one, zero, and one. You can say DB scan labels underscore and it returns back all these labels. But if you wanted only the unique labels, you could say unique DB scan labels and it will return negative one, zero, and one. And then you could also check the length of this. And you could determine this as number of unique clusters plus outliers identified. And this is something you could also keep track of throughout this loop if you wanted to see how that changes. Keep in mind that doesn't have as dramatic of a change as the actual number of outliers. So the curve is not gonna be as smooth. For that case, we won't go ahead and keep track of number of, out of clusters. We'll just keep track of outliers in terms of percent and raw numbers. Soon you'll see that 10 is probably way too high of an epsilon, but we don't know that yet, so we'll go ahead and run that. And then once that's done running, I'm going to say SNS line plot, line plot, and let's plot out with x equal to that linearly spaced number of epsilons we just tested. And then we'll say y is equal to, for example, the number of outliers. So we're going to copy that and paste it in. And so just running this, you should see kind of a very extreme or dramatic curve. All right, so what is this plot actually telling us and how can we interpret it to figure out a good range of epsilon values to test? Clearly, we can see that when it comes to these sort of elbow plots or knee plots, we are interested in inflection points. We're interested in this zone where it goes from some extreme number of outliers, like every point is an outlier, to some extreme number of no outliers. And we can see here that at 10 or nine or eight, there's essentially zero outliers. And we can easily confirm that by coming up here and testing out these really large epsilon values. So for example, epsilon is equal to 10, everything's cluster zero, there were no outliers. And it's the same for things like nine or eight. And it really isn't until, for example, epsilon seven, where you still retain one possible outlier. But for imagine, for this particular case, we can say we were expecting three outliers. So still epsilon of seven is quite large. So you have a couple of approaches here. You can, if you want, begin to zoom in on this line plot. For example, we can say PLT, something like X limb, and check out for the points you're interested in, somewhere between, for example, zero and two. And here you can begin to see where the curve is actually changing. But for this particular case, we probably still don't have enough points. It's not as smooth of a curve as we could have. So if you want, you could come back up here and begin changing it to something like only checking from 0 0.001 to seven, and maybe checking twice the amount of epsilon values there. So you would run this, and in order to see the plot again, you'd have to update this. So we get our new NP lin space, these new epsilon values, paste them in here, run this again, and now you're gonna see the same behavior, but it's a much smoother curve since we've doubled the amount of points. Something else we can begin to consider is if we're really familiar with the data set, perhaps we're looking for a particular threshold of outliers or percentage of outliers to consider. Keep in mind, while we are looking at number of outliers, we could make the exact same plot for the percent of outliers that we were calculating. So if we come back up here, notice we had the outlier percent. So I'm gonna copy that, paste it here, run that, and while this curve should in theory look exactly the same shape as this curve, it's the y-axis that's different. The y-axis here, and I'll put a label just to make it clear, this is the percent of points classified as outliers. Whoops, this should be PLT y label. There we go. So we start off at 100 points being classified as outliers, and then we go all the way down to something like 0% of points classified as outliers. And in this particular case, perhaps we know that we should be expecting three outliers. We could begin to discover this by saying PLT H lines and draw a vertical line at whatever value interests us. For example, Y is equal to three and we'll have it go from X min of zero to an X max of two, which is the X axis here. And we can also make it very clear by saying color is equal to red. And if you just do this, what it's going to do is draw a red vertical line at y is equal to three. We can still see y is going from zero to a thousand. So we should probably shorten that to something like PLT y limb going from, for example, zero to maybe 20, or actually that's still quite high. So we can say zero to 10. 
and this should begin to see where we actually begin to drop to find three outliers. And you can see that around epsilon of a little less than 0.75, depending on how many points we have here on this curve, as we really zoom in here, epsilon kind of somewhere between 0.5 and 1, that's where it finds that sweet spot that we're looking for of three outliers. And we can begin to confirm that. If we come back up here and say epsilon is equal to 0 0.75, run that. You can see it found those three outliers, but didn't classify any more than that. We can also see from this plot that if we were to go to something like, for instance, 0 0.3, somewhere in between there, we'd come back up here, run that, and it begins finding more outliers. So I want you to have this intuition of connecting and searching for this inflection point. Obviously it's super useful if you already know ahead of time the exact points of outliers you should be expecting. That is usually not the case, but you can use that in conjunction with outlier percentage with the same logic, but this time you could think of it in terms of percentage. For example, maybe you're interested here where only 1% of points are outliers. So you run that and that would draw a red line at around 1% of points. Obviously, you'd probably have to zoom in again. So we'd come back up here, PLT Y limb, set those same Y limits on this plot, and you'll see that plot show up. And again, we're looking at somewhere between 0.25 and 0.5. What you can do after this is come back up here, and instead of checking all the way up to seven, you only check up to one. Maybe you only need to check 100 points this time. And you can copy this, rerun the cell, and then come back up here to this NP lint space, paste that in, run this again, and you'll see the same behavior. It's just way more points this time to check out. Same for the line plot here. Same behavior, just more points in the curve to check out. Okay, so that's how you can think of trying to find the right epsilon. Again, you're constantly looking for those inflection points. It's gonna be a really similar idea for figuring out the minimum number of samples you should be considering as well. And sometimes people like to think of this in terms of number of unique clusters or number of points classified as outliers. You would do the exact same thing. So let's come back up here. I'm gonna put these in comments so we don't get confused. But we're gonna come back up here. We can calculate total outliers, percent of outliers. But now I'm gonna say instead of epsilon, we can go for something like min number of points or min samples. So I'll say for n in lin space, and here we shouldn't be dealing with actual lint space. We should probably be dealing with a range because we cannot have 0.5 of a point or one third of a point. These are whole integer numbers. So I'm gonna say NP arrange and we should start from one and continue up higher depending on how many points you have and how scattered your data set is. Something extreme could be like 100 points here. That's up to 10% of the points are gonna be classified as minimum number of samples. So keep in mind the higher the minimum number of samples is, then the more points are gonna be classified as outliers because they can't reach that threshold because there's not enough points in order for it to be considered a core point. And we'll also change here in epsilon to min samples is equal to n. So we run that, again, kind of an extreme case, but we would do the same idea here, SNS line plot, where x is equal to those samples we just tested out, np range, and then we could say y is equal to, for instance, outlier percent equal to outlier percent here. Run that and you see this kind of opposite plot. But essentially what's happening here is recall that the x label, so PLT x label, this is the minimum number of samples needed to be considered a core point. And the y label that we're charting out here this is the percent of points classified as an outlier. And you can see that as you increase that threshold of the minimum number of samples needed within that neighborhood to be considered a core point, then of course more and more points are gonna be considered as an outlier. And we can visually see this as well. If we were to come back up here and play around with DB scan, but instead of epsilon, start playing around with minimum number of samples, so I can say min samples, if I set that to something in the absolute extreme, such as one, then we can see here, then these points are actually no longer considered outliers, 
but they're considered their own clusters. So notice here, nothing's being labeled as negative one, but instead, dbscan is considering these each as its separate clusters. And we could begin to mix this around with epsilon. For example, an epsilon of, instead of 0 0.5, the default, something like 0 0.75. And this is trying to combine the two of them in order to figure out that these three points are not part of these two clusters, but dbscan is also not saying they're outliers because we said minimum number of samples is one. Recall that includes the point itself. So essentially with minimum samples of one, you would never get any outliers. P things that would usually be outliers will be classified as their own unique clusters. This could be useful to you if you wanted to think about things in terms of single point clusters instead of outliers. Now this is typically not the case. You could begin to expand on this to do something like maybe three points here and then we're quickly back to where we were before where all these outs are outliers. Now something to note here is a really good suggestion on where your starting point should be for minimum number of samples is two times the number of dimensions of your data. So something I like to do here is to say two times and then the number of dimensions of the data itself. So for example, in this particular case, the number of dimensions is gonna be equal to two blobs outliers and then just take shape of one which should be equal to two dimensions, x1 and x2, which means minimum number of samples is four. That's a really good starting position. And of course, you can use that when you're thinking about running this loop. So we run this, and we can see here we get the expected or desired results. All right, so as we've seen in a lot of different clustering methods or just machine learning methods in general, it's really helpful to have some sort of visualization guide where you're looking for an inflection point. I hope that's useful to you. I'll see you at the next lecture.